Well, it, you know, it, it kind of happened very random that I even got the opportunity to write the Black Panther. I was doing storyboards for a TV commercial, and lots of times I use comic book reference, like, I want to punch like Jack Kirby, I want this or that. And the storyboard artist I was working with says, hey, do you like Neil Adams' work? I'm like, oh, Neil Adams, he's a god, of course. So then he pulls out his phone, he calls Neil Adams and puts me on the phone. I'm like, I'm talking to Neil Adams, this is bananas. <laughs> so Neil says that I should visit him next time I come to New York. So a month later or so, I'm in New York. I, you know, I go by Neil's studio. We're chatting. I'm just happy to be there. And Neil goes, hey, you ever wrote comic books? I said, no. He says, would you like to? I go, yeah. So he pulls out his phone, and he calls Joe Quesada. So then the next day, I'm having a meeting with Joe Quesada. And uh, Joe brings in Axel Alonso, his, who's his executive editor. And we started talking. And he goes, well, do you want to write a comic book? And I said, yeah. So basically, I left with the assignment of Black Panther. And uh, virtually, it was just going to be a six issue miniseries, and then it turned into an ongoing series. Well, there's a couple of things. One, I, I wanted to lock in who the character was in a very definitive way. Uh, because I thought Stan and Jack wrote a very strong character. And subsequent renditions of the character went kind of up and down. Uh, like a lot of his run in the Avengers, he was not that Captain America equivalent I wanted him to be. Uh, and in the when he finally got his own book in Jungle Action, he got beat up too much for me. Now, this is a point that Dwayne McDuffie and I debate about a lot. Because Dwayne is like, I love that stuff. I love when he was just beat to a pulp and then he came back and won anyway. I'm like, nah, nah, I don't know. I, I got no appetite for that. I mean, I don't see Batman being built, built to a pulp and come back. No, I'm not checking for that, Dwayne. <laughs> so, you know, there's not, there's not a monolithic opinion. That was just my take. Like, I did not want to beat down like that. What I did love was Christopher Priest's take. You know, he really elevated the intelligence and the Dora Milaje, the, like the female bodyguards, who, who can go wrong with kick-ass female bodyguards. Uh, all that stuff was great. So I saw that. I loved that. So when they gave me a chance to write the book, I was like, wow, I get to kind of really lock in a lot of those ideas. And a lot of ideas I didn't think were controversial but turned out to be controversial. Like, I always read the book like Wakanda was an, always an unconquered country. That's the whole point yeah. of the book. But then when I stated that explicitly in my rendition, they were like, well, that's not true. Uh, you know, in issue 255, and I'm like, dude, beat it. <laughs> like, I don't care. <laughs> so uh, so I, you know, I liked it when I thought with the keep, because to me the whole point is, why do they have this advanced technology? Because, historically, historical fact, you know, in Benin, they had metal alloys where people in Europe were living in caves. So you go, okay, if at one point people in Africa had this cultural head start, well, what if that head start never stopped? What if you didn't have invaders to throw the whole, their whole, uh, game off. They just kept that head start the whole time. And that's the fundamental premise of the book. And also they're, the, they're this fierce warrior tribe because what does it take to never be conquered? From a neighboring African tribes to European invaders to whoever, you've got to really, at least once a generation, whoop ass on a pretty massive scale. So I thought, well, those are the two fundamental things that define who the Black Panther is and define everything else about the culture. Um, so to me, that was the, the key part of it.